example of what they want the children to do. They need to be a shining example of what the children need, how the children need to behave. In English, there's an expression, do as I say, not as I do. Okay, basically I say to be good and uh, do as I say, not the way I act. I mentioned many, many times in the Chinuch classes, there's a very simple analogy for this. We tell our children, don't lie. You have to speak the truth, you're not allowed to lie. It's forbidden to lie. Then one day in the house, the phone rings and the kid answers the, years ago. Today it doesn't exist, but there used to be a phone in the house. And when the phone rang in the house, a kid would answer the phone and he would say, Daddy, you have a phone call. And Daddy would say, tell him I'm not home. Tell him I'm not here. Okay, so what did you do? You basically taught the child it's okay to lie when it's convenient. It's okay to lie when it's convenient. I don't want to speak to the person on the phone. You could tell them, you could tell the child, tell him I'm unavailable now, I'll call him back later. But to lie to a child, that is a very bad living example of what the child should be doing and be behaving. So therefore the traders of Lahazid Gdailam Alaktanim, the adults, the Gdailam, the adults have to be shining. They have to be a living example to how the children need to behave. And it's really apropos nowadays, especially nowadays in our present situation. Parents are home a lot. Kids are home a lot. There's a lot of interconnection going on now between parents and children. Children don't learn from what we preach. Children learn from what we behave. The way we behave, that's the way the children are going to behave. When a child sees that the, if something is important to the parent, the child will emulate and copy the parent. If a child sees that for the parent it's not that, that important, so then the kid will learn also it's not important. We don't, the kids don't learn, children don't learn by preaching. Children learn, Rashi says, which means as follows. A lot of people are under pressure today. There's difficult panasa, everybody's home, everybody's under the same roof, everybody's driving, everybody crazy. There's a lot of pressure going on in the homes. You know what our children need to see? The way you react under pressure. It's very important. We don't realize this. Rashi says, which means that now that there's a lot of pressure, children need to see how do parents act and react under pressure. It's a very important lesson for them. Also, honesty. Today, people, kids will see them. The kids are seeing the parents more. Sometimes parents work out of the house. The kids will see the way the parents are conducting business from the house or whatever it may be. So the kids need to see a dogma that the parents should be a shining example for what, how the child should behave. Now the parents are not going to show. They're watching, the kids are watching them daven at home or learning at home. So the question is, do the kids see that this davening and learning is important? Does the parent daven like a mensch, learn like a mensch, do they behave properly? This is all, especially nowadays, this is all, a, what? this is all important in the way the child is going to react. And that's what Rashi says. How the parents dress, how the parents talk, how the parents walk, how the parents think, because as the kids see everything today. So that I believe is partially one very interesting lesson that we need to learn from the first Rashi of the whole parsha. The Torah also goes into the uh, laws of purity and impurity of a Koyin. We know that the Torah says, that you cannot become Tomei. So the Gemara says, the fact that the Torah says, the sons of Aaron. So from here, the Gemara learns out that female Koyanim meaning the daughter of a Kayin, the wife of a Kayin, 
is allowed to go to cemeteries. She can become tummy, she can come in contact with the dead body. It only applies to the male, not to the female. So there's a very interesting halacha question, by the way, which is brought down in halacha. What happens if the wife of a Kohen is pregnant? Is she allowed to go to a cemetery? What's the question? If she's having a girl, so then it's not a problem because the wife is not obligated in the mitzvah. The fetus, which is a baby girl, if she's having a girl, is also not obligated in the mitzvah. So then it wouldn't be a problem. But what happens years ago when you didn't know what you were having? A woman didn't know, am I, am I pregnant? Is she having a boy? Is she having a girl? So halacha says, is she allowed to go to the cemetery or not? And there's a very interesting halacha answer, even though it says to be better to be stricter about it. But the halacha is she's allowed to go to a cemetery. In technical halacha. Why? Number one, she might miscarry. God forbid, in those days it was pretty common that women miscarry. Secondly, even if she does have a baby, maybe it's a girl. So it's like 75% allowed, 25% not allowed. First of all, it's 50-50 if she's going to have a baby or God forbid miscarry. And even if she doesn't have a baby, maybe it's a boy, maybe it's a girl. So it's called 75, it's called a svex faker. In Allah, it's called a double doubt. A doubt is 50-50. A double doubt now is 75-25. 75% that she would be allowed to go because she, if it's, she might miscarry and it's not an issue. Or she might have a girl. But the question today is if a wife of a Kaya knows she's having a boy, and today a lot of people know what they're having, so logically, because of the fetus, the boy, she wouldn't be allowed to go to a cemetery. She wouldn't be allowed to go to a mortuary. She wouldn't be allowed to go under the same tree by a funeral. I mean, all the laws that would apply uh, to that uh, law of the Kayin. Now, there's a very interesting comment from the Rebbe. And the word Emor, Emor in the Chumash is called Aleph Mem Resh. Emor, speak, tell and then you have emer, and the second word is the amarta. You should say, speak and say. So the Rebbe says like this. Emer is aleph mem resh, which stands for eish, mayim, and ruach. Now, in Tanya's, we'll, we'll learn the Ramam quotes, even though scientifically there's over 100 basic elements, but even science agrees that there's four major elements, basic elements. Fire, air, earth, and water. Everything in the world is composed of these four elements. The only difference between one creation and the next creation is the proportion of fire, air, earth, and water that each thing has. But technically, every object in the world has fire, air, earth, and water. In Tanya, Dalt Rebbe explains that angels, this is very interesting, the body of angels, because we don't see them, comes in the two elements of fire and air. Dalt Rebbe says this in Tanya, that the body of an angel, that's why they're invisible, because what's tangible from the four elements? Mayim, the water, and the earth. So emerd is the three basic elements of Eish, Mayim, and Ruach, which the Rebbe explains is the three pillars that the world stands on. There is Torah, Avoda, and Gamilas Chasadim. Study of Torah, the act of davening, Karbonus sacrifices, and charitable deeds. So we know, we learned many times in Pirkei Ovis, that's chesed, gvura, and teferes. Kindness, severity, and mercy, or beauty. Eish, from the three elements. Eish is fire, that's the left, gvura. Mayim is on the right side, which is chesed. Gemilas chasadim is the middle pillar which is the attribute of Gemilas Chasadim. And Eish 
Mayim and Ruach refers to the three pillars that the world stands on. And therefore it comes like this. From the three pillars, you bring it into the Amarta, And this is Kabbalah, so I'm just going to say it and it is what it is. Tuf is the last letter of the Aleph base, and therefore it refers to earth, which is the lowest of all the four elements. So emerd, the Amarta means you should take the Jew is obligated to take the fire, air, and, and wa- air, uh, fire, water, and air, which is the level of the three pillars that the world stands on, and to bring it into the Amarta, which with the tough, which refers to earth, to bring it down into the physical, practical world. So the Rebbe explains very interestingly, emerged the Amarta, refers to a Jew bringing down the three pillars that the world stands on, Eish, Mayim, and Ruach, fire, water, and air, emerd, and bring it into the Amarta, into the element of earth, which is the lowest of all the elements which represents the earth itself. So this is what the purpose of the Jew is, to bring it down into the lower levels of the world. Okay, that's one aspect of the, of the Parsha. Later on in the Parsha, the Torah is talking about the Yom Tevim. In fact, the Kriya that we read on Pesach, Shavuos, and Sukkot is all from Parsha's Emer, from this week's Parsha. Uh, most of the, a good part of the Parsha is actually what we read on uh, Yom Tev from Pesach, Shavuos, and Sukkot. Now, when it comes to the mitzvah of Yom Tev, the Torah uses the expression like this, Ela meya de Hashem. Okay, these are the Yom Tevim, the holidays of Hashem. Asher tikru u Aisam, that you should call them, Mikroi Kedesh, a holy, a holy, basically a holy holiday, a holy calling. And then he says, Ela meya de, these are the, it goes into the Yom Tevim. So the Torah says like this, these are the Yom Tev, that you should call. But if you look in the Chumash, the word Aisam normally is spelled Aleph, Vav, Saf, Mem. Here it's spelled Aleph, Tav, Mem without the Vav. Now, if you don't have vowels, you're able to see it and read it Atem. Ela Mea de Hashem. These are the Yom Chadim of Hashem. That the Jew makes it happen. The best that makes it happen. Which means as follows. You ever notice in the Shabbos davening, the Shemana Esri, the Amid of the Shabbos davening, in the end of the middle bracha, we say, Baruch Ato Hashem, Mekadesh HaShabbos. Hashem sanctifies the Shabbos. If you look in the Yom Tev Siddur, it says, Mekadesh Yisrael the Hazmanim. He sanctifies the Jews and the times, meaning the Yom Tif. Why by Shabbos doesn't it say, Mekadesh Yisrael the Hashabbos? He sanctifies the Jews and Shabbos. But by Yom Tif, we say in Davani, Mekadesh Yisrael the Hazmanim. And interestingly, even if Yom Tif falls out on Shabbos, we say, Mekadesh HaShabbos, the Yisrael Vahazmani. And the reason for that is this Pasik. Hashem doesn't sanctify the Yom Tif. Hashem doesn't sanctify the Yom Tif. Who sanctifies the Yom Tif? Who makes the Yom Tif holy? Not Hashem, the Jews. Shabbos, the Gemara has the expression, Mekache, Nezaya, Mekache, Vekaima. Shabbos is self holy. Shabbos is holy. Seventh day, whether we like it or not, whether we make it, we, whether I say it's Sunday or Monday, it's Shabbos, it's a holy day. There's a very interesting Gemara. The Gemara says that the Malachim come to Hashem before Rosh Hashanah and they say, Hashem, God, when's Rosh Hashanah? 
we need to come to defend the Jews, prosecute the Jews. They all want to know when's the big day of judgment. So Hashem said, me? I don't know. Whenever the rabbinic courts, whenever Bezdin will say it's Yom Tif, then it's Yom Tif. It's not up to me. When the earthly court decides it's Yom Tif, God says it's Rosh Hashanah. Okay, we're going to come that day to judge the Jews. When the Jews decide it's Pesach, Shavuot, Sukkot, whenever, then we're going to come. What does that mean? The Chagim, the Yom Tif, is dependent on which day of the month it is. Pesach is the 15th of Nisan. Sukkot is the 15th of, of Tishrei. Yom Kippur is the 10th of Tishrei. Rosh Hashanah is the, the first of Tishrei. Shavuot is, could be different times. What does that mean? The Bezdin, years ago, years ago, I'm just giving a little bit of a history because it's very practical, very important to understand the Jewish history of the calendar. Years ago, they didn't have a calendar. Calendars were worthless. How did Bezdin know when Rosh Chodesh was? Because when Rosh Chodesh is, then 15 days later is Pesach, 15 days later is Sukkot, 10 days later is Yom Kippur, and that day is Rosh Hashanah. How did Bezdin know? How, how did, what happened? There would be two witnesses that came and testified that they saw the moon. And Bezdin would check them out. It took a very complicated examination to see exactly how they saw the moon. And if it was feasible to see the moon, the whole Gemara discusses this. Shulchan Aruch discusses this. In the time of the Beis Hamikdash, there were no calendars. Shabbos was set. Shabbos, seventh day of the week, regardless. Yom Tif was established by Bezdin. The witnesses came. They said, we saw the moon. Bezdin checked them out. Of course, checked them out and make sure they were honest and good. Bezdin said, okay, today's Rish Chodesh. Based on that, Pesach, Sokesh, Yom Kippur, whatever it is. Hillel had a grandson. The famous Hillel of, everybody knows the famous Hillel, he had a grandson whose name was Hillel. And he established the calendar. He established the calendar. Even though he was way in the middle of the era of the Mishnah, it seems that even in the era of the Gemara, which was much later, they also went based on the testimony of the witnesses. Even though they had a calendar but they went primarily on the testimony of the witnesses. Today, we don't have witnesses. We don't have a Bezdin. We don't have the big Bezdin had to be in Yerushalayim. We don't have that. So now, based on the calendar, because Torah says the Bezdin has the authority to proclaim when Rosh Chodesh is, based on that, we now know when Pesach Shavu Sukkot is. So therefore, what does it mean? So who proclaims Yom Tif? Bezdin proclaims the Yom Tif. So therefore, the Gemara says even more. Atem, Ashetikru Atem, that you call it? The Gemara says very profoundly. Atem means even if you did it intentionally, you made a wrong date. If Bezdin intentionally, for whatever reason is, made a wrong date, or they were accidental, making the wrong date, or they made a mistake or whatever, Whenever Bezdin proclaims Rosh Chodesh, that's when Rosh Chodesh is. It's not up to God. It's up to the Bezdin. Is that why we have now one or two days? Yeah. I'm not going into a whole calendar, but I'm just saying, so who makes the Yom Tif? Asher Tikru Atem. In fact, there was a very interesting story in the Gemara, which was one of the reasons why they ousted the famous Rabbi Gamliel as the head of the Jewish people, because he had a colleague, Rabbi Gamliel, by the name of Rabbi Yeshua. I mentioned in Pirkei Ovis, Rabbi Yeshua. Ashi Eladita, he was extremely, extremely brilliant. And he, he had an argument with, with Rabbi Yeshua. Rabbi Gamliel was the head of the Bezdin, but Rabbi Yeshua was the big guy up in the Bezdin. And they were fighting which day where Shreda should be. Ram Gamliel ruled, and he did this with Shema. He didn't do it because he had an ego. Ram Gamliel, and there was an adamant fight. When day was Rosh Chodesh. 
Ram Gamliel ordered Rab Yeshua to come to Ram Gamliel on the day Rab Yeshua thought was Yom Kippur. You should come to me with your walking stick and your money pouch. And Rabbi Yeshua, the, the great tzaddik that he was, came to Rabbi Gamliel on the day that Rabbi Gamliel said was not Yom Kippur, even though Rabbi Yeshua maintained it was Yom Kippur. Because the Yom Tif is up to Bezdin. And therefore, who makes the Yom Tif? Bezdin, the Jews. So therefore, by Shabbos, we say, Mekadesh Shabbos, because Hashem sanctifies the Shabbos. What happens by Yom Tif? Mekadesh Yisrael v'hazmanim. God sanctifies the Bezdin, the Jews, and then the Bezdin is able to make the Yom and Tevim holy. And that's the way it works in the whole uh, calendar. And what's interesting is, so therefore, when the Pasik says, Eila Mea de Hashem, either the Yom and Tevim, the Chagim, Asher Tikru Eisam. Now it means the Jews, Atta means the Jews. The Jews call them. What does it mean the Jews call the Yom Tif, call the Chag? Simply it means they say when the Yom Tif will be. But it's explained in Chassidus deeper than that. When I call you, unless if you're a teenager, you come to me. If I ask you to come, you're going to come. When you call somebody, what does that mean in a spiritual sense? You bring them down to you. You bring them to you. These are the Chagim of Hashem. Not Eisam, you read it, Atem. The Jews call Hashem down with the Kedusha. Meaning, when the Jews proclaim this and this day is Rosh Chodesh, and therefore 15 days later is Pesach, who brought that Kedusha of Hashem into the world on the Yom Tif, on the Chag? It was the Jews. And that again shows the greatness of the Jew, that the Jew calls the shot, so to speak, when Hashem's Kedusha comes into the world. And therefore we have the mitzvah of matzah, we have the mitzvah of sukkah, we have the mitzvah of fasting, mitzvah of shayfat. Who makes that happen? The Jews. Okay, next in, in the parsha. By the way, just to mention a little bit for a minute about the calendar that we just mentioned. The calendar was made, we said, by the grandson of Hillel, whose name was also Hillel. He set up a 19-year cycle calendar. Now, we know in Jewish law, we have leap years, and we have regular years, right? Regular years mean 12 months. A leap year, we have two others, so we have 13 months. In the secular calendar, the, the solar calendar, we have a leap year once every four years. Now, why is that? Because the solar year, the solar calendar, the solar year, is it's a big argument in Torah and in science, but we're talking just in a practical level. The solar calendar is 365 and a quarter days. 365 and a quarter days, not 365. It's 365 and a quarter. So every four years in the, sec in the solar calendar, the secular calendar, you need to make another day because that's why you're February 29th. I don't want to get into it now. The Gregorian calendar did not begin from January, it began from March. And therefore, the last day of the year was February 28th. So in a leap year, they added another day to the year by making February 29th. The lunar calendar that we go, the Jews go by, go according to, the lunar calendar has 354 days, which approximately, there's also an argument exactly how much, but approximately 354 days versus 365 days, okay? So the problem is, the Jewish calendar is 11 days shorter than the solar calendar. 
So after three years, if you just go in the regular lunar calendar, you're going to be missing 33 days, 11 times three. After 10 years, we'll be missing 110 days, right? Simple math. Which means, if you do that, and by the way, the Muslims do that, Taka, because they don't have the extra month. In the Jewish calendar, we can't do that. Why not? Because the Torah says Pesach has to be in the spring. In the spring. Now, if you're going to keep losing 11 days a year, you're going to end up with a snowy Pesach. It's going to be in the middle of the winter. It's going to be snowy. And Torah says it has to be in the summer. So what did they do in this setup? In fact, in, even in the time of the Besdin, they would have big, long meetings of the Besdin. They would seclude themselves and figure out, do we need to make a leap year or do we not make the leap? And the Gemara Rosh Hashanah elaborates when yes and for what yes and for what no. And, but what do we have in our calendar? So the way Hillel's grandson, Hillel, set it up was there's a 19-year cycle. I count the gold by 19 years. Of the 19 years, there's 12 regular non-leap years and seven leap years. So from the 19-year cycle, there's seven leap years with two months, and there's 12 months without the leap year. After 19 years, the solar and the lunar equal out. And therefore, many people, not me personally, never happened to me, but many people, every 19 years, the Hebrew birthday and the English birthday is on the same day. Why? Because it's exactly 19 year cycle is almost exactly of the 19 year cycle. So then the solar and the lunar equal. So that's the history of the calendar that we have. But now, because Hill set up the calendar until the end of time, until Mashiach comes. And the Rambam says, when Mashiach comes, we're going to go back to the way it was. No more calendars. We're going to go back to the Bezdin, and they're going to decide. So uh, that's what's going to happen in Metesha. Okay, the next level. The next thing in the Parsha, also interestingly in this Parsha, is the Mitzvah of Svira Sa'imer. Counting the Oymer. What's the mitzvah of counting the Oymer? The Torah says you count. The Torah says 50 days. The Torah says it doesn't mean 50. It means up to 50. Not including the 50. So what is this whole concept of Svartam Nacham Mimachar Sashabbos? It says you have to count Svira. What's counting Svira Sa'imer? Sphere Sa'ima means that a mitzvah and in the time of the Beis Amigdash was biblical. Nowadays, according to most opinions, it's rabbinic. There is a mitzvah of counting the Omer. From the second day of Shavu, a Pesach, yom yom echad with the bracha, yom sheni, shnei yom leim, yom leim, and so on, all the way up to 49. What is the mitzvah? And the Rebbe explains it's a very, very unique mitzvah. It's a mitzvah, one of its kind. You don't do anything. It's not that you put on tefillin, you light Shabbos candles, you eat matzah, you eat in a sukkah, you do lulav in a sukkah. You put on tefillin, tzitzis. No. What is the mitzvah? The mitzvah is to count time. Counting time. That's the mitzvah. There's no other mitzvah than this mitzvah of counting time. What does the word svira mean? Just like we said before, the word Zohar means to shine. Sphira comes from the word Evan Sapir, sapphire stone, by the way. Hashemayim misaprim, we say Shabbos and Davani from Tilim. The heavens tell, literally means tell. What do you mean tell? They reveal the glory of Hashem. Sphira so Eimer means not only the midst of counting days, but Svidas Ha'emed <clears throat> means to shine into the day. To shine into the day. 
David HaMalach in Tillam says, Lemneis yameinu kein heida, benavi levav chachma. We say it in davening every Shabbos also, by the way. David HaMalach has to show me, we say Shabbos in davening. Lemneis yameinu kein heida. God, teach us how to count our days. That's the mitzvah of Surah Sa'ima. Counting days. What's the Indian of counting? What's the Indian of counting days? Counting days is there's a halacha in 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 Shkunoruch. Davar shebeminyan leibatim. Something counted never becomes nullified. You know, in halacha you have meat and milk, trade and kosher, one in sixty. Sometimes it's one in a hundred. Sometimes it's one in two hundred. The various different laws of nullification. The Gemara says the Allah is something which is counted never becomes nullified. Because by counting it, Allah says, what's the reason for that? It becomes important. Counting something makes it important. What is the mitzvah of Svira Soeme? The mitzvah is to make time precious. We learned many times in America, there's an expression, I have, to, I have time to kill. Let's kill time. You know, we have time to waste. Let's, let's kill time. In America, there's an expression, time is money. Okay, that's a very important uh, thing. In Torah, time is life. What is life? Life is how long we live. Life is time. That's it. You waste an hour, that hour you're never going to get back again. So you wasted life, an hour of life. See, our problem is we live 120 years. 120 years, there's X amount of hours. So, so many, many hours. Okay, we'll kill a little bit, a few hours here, there, there. And they add up. And they add up could be years that we actually kill and waste time. What is the mitzvah of Sfirah Sa'imed? There's a twofold mitzvah over here. Number one, that it should be important. We count it, it should be important. Secondly, we need to shine in the days. They once asked a very great uh, scholar, they asked Tabat Chochem, a great tzaddik once, how long did it take you to become a scholar? And he said, five minutes. Said, five minutes? He said, yeah. Five minutes here, five minutes there, five minutes there, five minutes there, he could become a scholar. In fact, there were many great rabbis that, uh, you know, you go call somebody, you put you on hold for about an hour and a half. And then whatever it is, they would have a safer or a tillim near the phone. And they would be waiting. They would open the tillim, say a parak of two of tillim. Believe it or not, it adds up. If they can learn a mishnah, they can learn a pasik of chumash, they can learn a piece of Gemara, Mishnah, whatever. It adds up. You know, the Rebbe Secretary, Rabbi Klein, Oliver Shalom, used to say that he was amazed. The Rebbe would come in from davening, or whenever it was, Shabbos, during the week, whatever it was. The Rebbe would come into his office after davening. The first thing the Rebbe did, he said, he put down his hat, he like threw off his hat, and right away opened the safe and started learning. By the Rebbe, every second was precious. When the Rebbe would go outside, when guests that came to the Rebbe for Yom Tif, so when the guests were going back to Israel or wherever they were from, you know, London, England, wherever it was, the Rebbe would come outside, all the people would be there ready to leave. They would leave from 770. The Rebbe would come outside and the Rebbe would look at the guests and wait until the last bus or whoever was taking them was out of sight. And then the Rebbe turned back and went into his room. It was called the Malava the Archim, which is a very big mitzvah of escorting the guests uh, when they leave. I saw myself so many times, the Rebbe walked out of his room, his mouth was moving. His mouth was moving. He wasn't talking to himself. Today you walk in the street, everybody's talking to themselves on their phones, they're talking to themselves. The Rebbe walked out, his mouth already was moving. What he was saying, I don't know, Mishnah, Gemara, Tanya, I don't know what he was saying. The Rebbe used to walk home, 
Friday night, Shabbos day, the Rebbe used to come walk. He didn't get a ride then. He, obviously, he would walk. The Rebbe walked out of 770, and the Bachim used to walk the Rebbe home. We saw. The Rebbe walked out, and the Rebbe's mouth was moving the whole time speaking Taylor. The previous Rebbe writes that people should, and the Rebbe emphasized it many, many times, people should have ask, things of Torah memorized, whether it's Chumash, Tilim, Tanya, Mishnayis, anything. Things of Torah memorized. That when you're somewhere in the street, your mind can be full of Torah instead of looking at the stupid things that are going on all over the place, the foolish things. A person should not waste time. And you'd be surprised of all the time we waste. They say, I forgot what the statistic, I used to know it. They said, a person during their lifetime wastes a ye years of their life just waiting. Waiting in line, waiting on the phone, waiting for this, waiting for that, waiting for the plane to go, waiting for whatever. People waste years of their life. And the mitzvah of Svira Soimad is actually the mitzvah of counting time, meaning make time important and precious. And by the way, this is what our kids need to see now also. The parents are home. The kids need to see that the parents don't kill, waste time. They need to see the parents doing what they need to be doing. What? What is the Omer? The Omer is actually uh, a carbon, a barley that they brought to allow the new fruits to be eaten from the new grains to be eaten. But I, I'm not going into that now. It, it's too long. It's too complicated. Okay. So, so the mitzvah of Svir Yisraelim is two things. Time should be precious. And also we illuminate the time using it wisely. And there's another interesting halacha that Rebbe quoted so many times in reference to this. There's a mitzvah to listen to the Megillah reading I'm putting. And the Mishnah says in Megillah, Mevatlin Talmud Torah, there's certain mitzvahs that the Gemara says you stop learning Torah to do a mitzvah. For a wedding, a funeral, many mitzvahs, the Gemara says Mevatlin Talmud Torah for various different things. One of the things the Mishnah says <clears throat> you do Bittal Torah for, what do you stop learning for? To hear the Megillah. So the Rebbe asked, one minute, Megillah is also Torah. Why is it called stopping to learn Torah? You stop learning Torah to listen to the Megillah. The question is, what do you mean? The Megillah is also Torah. And the Rebbe explains from here, you see a very interesting halacha. Megillah we don't learn. The night of Megillah, they read the Megillah, we're just listening to it superficially. The Rebbe says, if you can learn Torah in depth and instead you learn it superficially or to ex extrapolate it a little bit, if you could do something with more intensity and you do something with less intensity, the Torah says that's Bittal Torah. That's called not learning Torah. The Gemara says to, to read the Megillah, you have to stop learning Torah. But why is it called stopping to learn Torah? Because if you can learn Torah in depth and you're going to learn it only superficially, that's called not learning Torah properly. And that's what the mitzvah Svira Sa'imah is. The mitzvah Svira Sa'imah is to make sure that every day is counted. And it's all in this week's version. Every day is counted and also that you shine and illuminate um, those things that need to be illuminated. Okay, I have more things to do. Are there any questions so far? Anybody can unmute themselves if they want. No questions? Yeah. No questions. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Rabbi, is is a, a woman a Cohen allowed to go to the graveside? Yeah, a wife, a woman, it doesn't apply. That's what we're saying. The laws of Kohen doesn't apply to women. Even if the woman is a Kohen? Yeah, even if she's the daughter of a Kohen, she's allowed to go. Unless she's, if she's pregnant, then we said she might be having a boy. So then it's, you know, questionable. But yeah, that's the, the story with that. Okay. In fact, there's a, another interesting point. 
uh, coming back to the coin, you mentioned coin, coming back to the coin. Um, a coin could become impure for seven relatives. Only for seven relatives. And the Pasuk himself itself enumerates what the seven are. His wife, mother, father, son, daughter, brother, and a sister that wasn't married. Okay, those are the seven people a Kohen could become impure, meaning they can go to the funeral. Just to talk a little halacha for a minute. The problem is, how do you get back from the, from the, from the grave? In other words, therefore, whatever the Kohenim, like they're supposed to be buried by the, like, by the road, that you don't have to go over any other graves when you come back from the funeral. To go to the funeral, you're allowed to. But to come back, then you're not allowed to. But so the laws of, so there's a very interesting question that a guy asked, I believe it was Rabbi Akiva. Uh -huh. He said, there's no question that your God is a Kohen. There's no question God is a Kohen, right? I mean, God is holy. A Kohen is holy. God. So he mm -hmm. asked, he asked Rabbi Akiva, if that's the case, it says at the end of Chumash that God buried Meishu Rabbeinu. God buried Meishu Rabbeinu. Wow. If God is a Kohen, how could he bury Meishu Rabbeinu becoming impure? So the Gemara answers, what did Rabbi Akiva tell him? That the Jews are called Bonim Atam Lashem Alokechem. We are God's children. And the din is, a Kohen could become Tomei, could become impure for a son. So because Meishu Rabbeinu is God's son, the Jew, the, the, with God's children, so therefore Hashem becomes, that's what he answered him. So the commentary just and the Rebbe has a very, pretty complicated sikh about this. But the Rebbe asks, one minute, God is not a regular Kohen. God is a Kohen Gadol. And the law is a Kohen Gadol cannot become impure for anybody. So now the question is back, how did God bury Meishu Rabbeinu? God is a Kohen Gadol, and the din is a Kohen Gadol cannot become Tommy for nobody. Unless if he finds a body in the middle of the road, a mess mitzvah is called, then even a Kohen Gadol could become Tommy if there's nobody else to do it. And there's a whole Sikha from the Rebbe explaining that the whole concept of impurity only applies to an Hashem in a body, and therefore God doesn't have a body, so the whole concept of impurity doesn't exist. And therefore Hashem was able to bury Meshe Rabbeinu because the whole concept of impurity doesn't even, didn't even exist in, in that time. But uh, when, we go to, uh, when we go to New York to Rebbe's uh, yard side, right. they do these things that are like a protection. Right, that's why they're there. The reason why those fences are there is because there are graves on the side, right? And a coin cannot come within four cubits, six feet of a grave. He can't come under any trees, you know, that are under him and under the dead body, under right. the tree. So they made it, there's actually a wall. You have a watch, it's, it's a, a fence yeah. with material. There's a, there's a fence all the way from the building, all the way into the Rebbe's oil. And in the oil around the graves, there's this wall, which is 10 Tfachim high, which is yes. the wall. And therefore, there's no problem, and there's no trees overhead. And therefore, there's no problem of a coin going to the oil. The only issue with a coin going to the oil hell is when you, you, know, you tear up your paper and you put it into the grave. So a coin shouldn't stick his hand over the grave. Okay? Because then he's covering it. And therefore, what they do is either like flip it over or give it to somebody else to give over. But this is another point which I didn't think I was going to get into today. And that is, um, it's Sadiqim, even when they're dead, are called alive. So the Gemara says at the end of Ksubis that the day Rabbi died, the Buddha Nasi died, Bottle Kuhuna. And one of the rabbis literally testified that that meant that Kayanim were allowed to go to the cemetery and take care of Rebbe's body because he was so holy, he, he's never impure. And therefore, the thesis at the end of Subas brings down 
there was one of the people from Tesis who was called Reb Chaim HaKohen. And this Reb Chaim HaKohen said, if I would have been there when Rabbeinu Tam, the author of Tesis, Rashi's grandson, passed away, I would have gone to the funeral, I would have become impure, based on that Gemara. But the Pearl, there's a lot of response written about that in the Hasidic community. Even the graves in Israel, they make sure there's fences that you don't actually come uh, connected to the grave. Okay, there's a few, just a few more things. Um, the Torah also speaks about the, the women that a crane is not allowed to marry. Okay. What? In this parsha? In this parsha, yeah. The Torah says, Isha zona v'chalala lo yikachu v'isha grusha me'isha lo yikachu. The Torah says a number of women, because the Kohen is so holy, he's not allowed to marry certain women. Who is that? The Torah called Zaina, which does not mean a harlot. It means a woman that had intimacy with somebody she would not be allowed to marry. Chalala is the child of a Kohen who married a woman he's not allowed to marry. Or like it says, a divorcee, for instance. If a coin married a woman who was a divorcee, but she wasn't allowed to marry her, their child is not a Kohen. It's called Chalala if she's female, or Cholol if he's a male Kohen. Which means, the Torah says, if a coin married a divorcee and gave birth to a girl, a coin cannot marry that girl. The Torah clearly says he's not allowed to marry that girl. Uh, a girl that was married to um, a guy, or had intimacy with a guy, would not be allowed to marry a Kohen either. It's a big problem today in the world, just from a practical point of view. Kohenim that are Bali Tshuva, you know, they, as we call them, late beginners, and want to get married, and a lot of girls today were on campuses, and they, you know, if she was with a Jewish boy, because she would be allowed to marry him, she wouldn't be called a Zona. A zona is if a girl had relations with somebody she would not be allowed to marry. For instance, if there was incest with a brother, because she's not allowed to marry a brother, that incest to his act disqualifies the girl from marrying a Kohen. If a girl was with intimate with a non-Jew even once, then the, the, the Kohen cannot marry that girl. Wow. And, and then there's another then, which is only what's called what's called lechatchila, and this is also, in fact, I had a call about this. In fact, two two things about a kohen. If a girl's father is non-Jewish, if a girl's father is not Jewish, even though the mother is Jewish and the girl is a hundred percent Jewish, she cannot marry a kohen. If they got married, they don't have to divorce. A coin, if he married a divorcee or the zono halachically, they need to get divorced, even if they got married. But if a girl's father wasn't Jewish and the coin didn't know whatever, they didn't realize whatever the mistake was, and they got married, then, then the, the din is that uh, he cannot marry her. But if they got married, they, they don't have to divorce. What? No. Even, even if the mother is Jewish. No, now, there's another thing, by the way, while, I mean, while we're on this topic, that if both parents, I cannot talk now, if there's, the both parents uh, were converts before the girl was married, before the, I'm sorry, before the girl was born, both parents converted properly, halachically, 100% Jewish, the girl is 100% Jewish, if both parents converted, the custom is that the girl cannot marry the coin. But again, if they got married, they don't have to divorce. In fact, there's a famous Sephardic name, Azulai. You ever hear the name Azulai? And most of them are Koyanim. Where did they get this name Azulai from? Azulai is an acronym for Isha, Al Zona, Chalala, Lo Yikochu. Azulai, Ali, Aleph, Zion, Vav, Lamed, Yud. That's how you say Azulai. That's for Isha, Zona, Vichalala, Lo Yikachu. 
because that was the, like the name for Kainim, because also the women they wouldn't be allowed to marry. So that's basically uh, that the Kain the Kain would have a, that would be the name of a lot of uh, Kohanim in in the Sephardic community, especially. Okay, are there any questions? Any questions? No questions. Great. Thank you very much, Rabbi. One second. One second. Wednesday night is Halacha and Tanya, 8 o'clock. Thursday night, we're having a Fabrengen, 8 o'clock, in honor of Pesach Sheni. Also, Zoom, you want to tell your friends about it, tell your friends about the classes, and don't forget for the men to Davin Marvin Count Sviritz in today's Parsha, and everybody should have a great week. Quick question. When is the last night for uh, Kiddush Lavana? The last night this month with Kiddush Lavana, I'll tell you in a second. Any second. Um, this month is here. One second. Thirty people now. Um, Thursday day. So it has to be Wednesday night is the last night. Thank you. Wednesday night is the last night for Kiddush Laban. Thank you. Have a great evening, everybody. Thank you, Rabbi. Rabbi, 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 Rabbi you're going to send out a link for the. Uh, for the Thursday night for bringing, so I can say it's the same link. Okay, thank you. All the classes, I don't know what happened today, got messed up. I don't know what happened, but uh, it's all the same link. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you so much, Rabbi. Take care, all the best. Thank, thank you, Rabbi. You. Thanks, Rabbi. Thank, thanks so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Are you in Chile? Yes, Rabbi. I'm in Chile. Wow, all the way to Chile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What time yeah. is it we, right now? What time is it? Uh, right? it's, it's now uh, midnight. Oh, we going up so late. Um, I, I just wanted to join the classes, which are really oh, great, Rob. So we miss you. So, so yeah, we, we, I, I miss you all, all a lot, really. And, okay, uh, fine. Pay us a visit, Beverly Hill. Yes, okay. I would, I would love. So, we'll see when it can happen. Okay, great. Take care. So, take care also, Rob. Right. Thanks so much. Huh? Take care. And all the best for everybody. Huh? Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye.